apology at the beginning. This isn't a, a carefully worked out lecture of um, analysis. It's an up-to-date news bulletin of where we are at the moment. So there are lots and lots of new, loose ends, but it is simply letting people know that a great project is starting. Historic Scotland have decided to be, historic environment Scotland have started to begin to invest in a redisplay of the uh, historic objects at St Andrew's Cathedral. And I'm going to first of all show you the problem that we're facing and then look at a few uh, solutions that may be coming up uh, as a result. Uh, at the moment, the, uh, most of you probably know, the museum collection is in these two buildings adjacent to the cloister, and neither of them are at least bit suitable for the objects that they're showing. The, uh, the, 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 the building to the east has got the St. Andrew's sarcophagus in it, has a little bit more light, but it's cramped and it's crowded. The one to the west is absolutely pitch dark and sopping wet and overcrowded and unlabeled and People go in there and are completely baffled by what they see. So there are problems with changing the, the attitude towards St Andrew's Cathedral. Because when I said at Aberdeen, I'm working at St Andrew's, they sort of said, uh, yes, at St Andrew's Cathedral, which one's that? It's like St Peter's in Rome. It's like Canterbury Cathedral in England. It's St Andrew's Cathedral, the premier church in Scotland. And it really doesn't hit the spot because people th come to St. Andrews for the golf. So we can see that the, uh, there is this diminishing returns of uh, over a, nearly one and a half million people to St. Edinburgh Castle, 600,000 visitors to St. Andrews itself. 97% of those apparently walk to the end of the town and look at the cliff. And uh, a lot of them uh, reach the cathedral but don't go in and pay any tickets. And yeah, 56,000 only go into the Cathedral Museum. And I think it's possible to make that much more of a meaningful destination and enrich people's experience of St. Andrews beyond the golf uh, fixation and perhaps beyond the sort of shock horror of the castle. Uh, there are problems with the current display. Uh, there is very poor lighting, which means it's almost impossible to see the carvings at all. The access is atrocious, there are stairs, the stones are back to back with each other, you can't see behind them, they're sopping wet, um, there's very, very little information about them at all, they are overcrowded, there's no selection, there's no highlight, you don't get an idea of what's important in the collection. It's deeply unpleasant to go there, John and I have worked there freezing cold uh, in, in this damp climate. They also have this <laughs> plane chant going on, a complete band, which drives you nuts, going on and on and on, can't, and they can't turn it off. Um, it's miserable for the custodians to work there. It's miserable for them to try and explain things to the public. Uh, and many of the visitors who come that I sat there and watched them and said, you know, what are you making of this? They are baffled and they walk out fairly quickly. Uh, so what can we do to make this better? Well, there are bubbling ideas that could could uh, make this a lot better. The start is to actually identify how many stones there are and recognize what the uh, collection amounts to. And this is talking about the, the I'm, I'm talking about the early Christian stones, not the later gravestones and so on from after the um, from the Middle Ages and onwards. I think what we need to do is rather than try and show the whole lot badly, show the very best ones to their absolute uh, perfection in, in lighting and interpretation and explanation and ultimately do something to create a whole new museum. That is another ball game completely because what are you going to do? Are you going to reuse those old existing buildings? Are you going to build a new building? I, one hardly dares talk about that and I'm only looking at the stones so that's a dream ahead but this is what we're working towards. Historic Environment Scotland actually has a very good track record recently, particularly spearheaded by Peter Yeoman, in displaying its carved stone collections in brilliant, new, meaningful ways. And each one of them is done in a different way that gives you a different experience. And I would say that the experience of going to the new Iona display is absolutely uh, earth shattering, keeping it all in the dark with spotlights on just spectacular objects and then having this trick of 
of the rotating light which allows the stones to come alive as though they are experiencing daylight and sunset and sunrise around the carvings and they come to light in different ways. Um, the amount of information and beauty and thrill that you get in the uh, Iona display is really spectacular. Uh, yes, here with the lights that change all the way around the, the great standing crosses so you can experience them as if they were outside. And these guys, they made me, you find them around a corner, they made me take my breath away. I thought I was going to be attacked when they suddenly popped out from behind a corner. They are stupendously well lit and, and lurking in, in the corner of the, of, the, of the room. Now, a completely different approach was taken at Whithorn, where the idea was to actually bring in daylight and show a very different sort of collection. Whithorn is difficult because most of the stones are very similar to each other. They don't have, an, most of them don't have an immediate appeal. It's a kind of Whithorn school of, of rather similar stones. But they're arranged in a new way with a top lit sky scudding over, clouds moving. They react to the light and they speak to each other very, very effectively there. And here's uh, my, my own uh, St. <laughs> Bidgeons, where two, or two tiny cottages were knocked into one and given top lights as well. And with a combination of uh, roof lights and really good um, directional lighting on each stone, raising the stones up on plinths so that you could see them at the right height, uh, I've found as a fairly satisfactory experience. I find it beautiful in that building, actually. Um, the way the stones speak to each other, you can move around them, you can see them clearly, and there is a certain amount of interpretation that doesn't really clog you up or interfere with the experience of the stones. But St. Andrew's is more difficult because you've got these deep dungeons in which to, to operate. So we have to look more at other displays where the, uh, light, where the environment is more challenging. A particularly good effort has been made at Elgin Cathedral as well, where a dark space has been lit up spectacularly with, with modern lighting. And really, in the big scheme of things, just bringing in good light isn't a very expensive part of a project, I don't, I don't think, uh, because it just uses the, the medium of light to do all the work that um, computer projections and all that sort of thing would otherwise do. Uh, another place with a big problem uh, or two places with big problem areas and a massive demand for display are York Minster, where they have put all their stone collection and their difficult to understand early material down into an undercroft with that wonderful maze of passages leading you through the undercroft where you're actually at the level of the older building underneath the great Gothic cathedral. And once again, lighting the original walls around you give a very authentic experience indeed. And the most recent one uh, where spectacular ingenuity has been employed is at Westminster Abbey, where you'd think there's not a speck of space for more display. They've made a museum up in the Triforium, which, or in the Tribune Gallery, which makes use of all the great Gothic windows and has provided a very clear new environment for displaying a lot of complicated stones telling a complicated story. Uh, with St. Andrews, <laughs> we've had considerable problems. It's not, you know, if you were starting this project, you wouldn't want to start from here. There were seven different numbering schemes attached to any random number of stones, and the numbers attached to the stones weren't necessarily attached to a photograph. So although Hay Fleming had done a great job in um, creating his original list of the stones in the 1930s, there are add-ons and extras, and some of Hay Fleming's illustrations don't quite illustrate which stones uh, they are, and you can't identify them very easily. Uh, so, and now we have 95 stones, each stone has six faces, and all of that needs to be uh, properly catalogued and uh, discussed before we can start to make sense of the story. Um, in order to try and even find where the stones were, my high-tech solution was to stick colored post-it notes over everything and hope that they'd stick on long enough for me to be able to attach a number to a physical stone. Some of them were in South Gile, some of them were in another shed. I mean, you, it was so difficult to bring all the numbers together. But we now do have a running system of all the stones numbered. We can say which one is which, and it has a photograph attached to it. 
And that is the next stage for me, is going to be to use the material that John is providing uh, to actually analyze the stones and make sense of what on earth the collection consists of, um, which is where I hand over to, um, to John. Okay, in order to help Jane's process of analysing and cataloguing, what have you, um, the first step for us is to do a, a thorough uh, record of all the sculpture, um, photographically and the measured drawings. The most up-to-date um, record and the most comprehensive record we have is Hay Fleming, published in 1931, and it is neither um, up-to-date nor comprehensive. Um, so, frankly, a, a detailed record of this um, collection is long overdue. It is the second largest assemblage of early medieval sculpture in Scotland, second only to Iona and only by a small margin. <clears throat> and thereafter, it's a large way ahead in terms of size from any of uh, uh, from the third and fourth um, uh, largest uh, assemblages. So this visual stock-taking exercise um, will stand alongside uh, Jane's, Jane's written description and hopefully assist uh, with her analysis. Um, the point being that the new display will be all the better if we know what we're working with. <clears throat> Current layout, um, as Jane has said, makes the task very difficult. Uh, at times impossible, some stones are slotted into concrete bases, so hiding the, uh, the, the bottom part. Uh, the tenon in many instances. Um, many of them are placed back to back, side by side. Um, so we haven't actually, as yet, made a full visual record. Uh, and we won't be able to do that until the, uh, the current display is dismantled. And we're relying quite a lot on our colleagues from conservation to help with this. The existing um, interpretive material is somewhat damning um, to the St Andrew's House style, and there's a quote from one of the uh, uh, information panels that's on display. Um, and I, I think it's, um, it's true that there is a, a, a level of similarity to it. Um, but the fact is, no two of, of the crosses are exactly the same. Adrian Maldonado has, has observed the fact that they are working on a modular basis. They have what might be described as quite a limited range of um, components, but they are arranging these um, and combining them um, in different um, uh, kind of groupings. So there are no two that are exactly the same. Similar, yes, but not exactly the same. Um, and beyond the house style, there is actually quite a huge amount of variety of ornament. Uh, quite a lot of vine scroll, for example, um, is evident, uh, belying it, um, influence from Anglo-Saxon sculpture. Uh, we have not much, but a little bit of zoomorphic um, animal carving. I particularly like the little Pictish um, dragon-esque um, creature that's biting the tip of its own tail. Uh, there's a lot of uh, use of spiral ornament, um, three and four coil, coil spirals. Um, we've got spiral morphing into diagonal key pattern, um, a sort of angular key pattern into lace hybrid. And where we do have a uh, figurative imagery, um, it is quite rich, um, uh, uh, interesting, um, clearly with um, presumably uh, biblical um, significance and biblical meaning. And as well as this house style which dominates, we have actually some very individualistic uh, designs and forms um, uh, present there. Uh, quite unusual things which are, to the best of my knowledge, um, rare if not unique within a, a, a Pictish context. And indeed, on one um, uh, one of the cross slabs, which is now on display in the castle uh, in, uh, visitor centre, we have identified from the photograph in Hay Fleming's book 
something that I think is unique. These little roundels on at least three, possibly all four arms of the cross, which look like they have little um, spiral ornament within them. I'm not aware of any other piece of picture sculpture with this ornament within the cross. Unique. As yet unrecorded because that side has been put in face to the wall. Um, when they were putting the display together, they clearly hadn't really recognised the significance or the importance um, of what they were putting out of sight. <clears throat> uh, looking at the St. Leonard Shrine, I think we've got um, evidence or a hint of what might be a, a ridge animal running along the top. Um, this nicely rounded rump at one end and a little stylized square tail and then these clasping limbs uh, with sort of paddle shaped paws. Um, uh, the head being uh, long since knocked off or eroded. And just towards the end of uh, our recording process, Jane spotted what might well be um, original pigment, um, a, a, a reddish line within the, uh, the median line of the uh, interlace on one or two stones. So um, a lot going on. And at that, I will pass you over to Jane to finish off. Well, this has been the most fantastic collaboration with John, working beside him and watching his eyes articulate what I'm trying to put into words is just a fantastic experience. And it's been great having, you know, working together as a team to get this through and actually see the, the completion of, of the collection. The one stone that we haven't mentioned so far is the sarcophagus, which does, okay, it's sitting in the room uh, with other things in it and a little panel beside it. It's low down, you can't really see it properly. And I think it is so underplayed and so underestimated that it deserves, the more I look at it, deserves to be treated like the Irish treat the Book of Kells in a kind of uh, a special apse to itself with special lighting and special interpretation. This monument uh, is so spectacular. In the book uh, by Sally Foster of, of the um, St. Andrew's Sarcophagus, there is one chapter on comparisons abroad. That chapter has no illustrations whatsoever because there is nothing like it in the whole rest of Europe. This is unique and it's incredibly expressive. Uh, and I've got lots of theories of what I think it's all about. It's about the Psalms. It's explaining words from the Psalms and kingship. And I think there's an a, opportunity here to bring this out in a way that would make people come from Germany and France to see what's happening in St. Andrews at the time Pepin and Charlemagne are rising to greatness abroad. This is already happening in Pictland in a way that they hadn't even thought of abroad. So um, that's the, uh, the, the end part of the story, to make the center of it this sarcophagus, uh, which begins the whole story. I think it's probably the earliest piece there, as far as we know so far. And then make that collection of gravestones tell another story of the continuing community uh, from a period where so little documentary history survives of the Pictish church. But that story is being told in those stones, if we can understand them. <laughs>